All right, why don't we get going now? Um, of course, this is the, uh, the last lecture before the exam, right? Exam tomorrow night, Thursday night, 7 to 9 p.m. You guys get the email from me about the rooms? Yeah? Okay. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then go look at the class website either on the front page or the exam page. I don't have a working Wi-Fi right now, but if you go to those pages, it'll tell you that you guys are being sliced up into different rooms based on what your last name is. So please make sure to go to the right room tomorrow. The exam is not in here in this room. It's in these three other rooms scattered around the quad for some reason. Um, that's just how they do things here at Stanford. Um, so uh, please make sure to go to the right room. Like I, I'm not responsible for you if you don't go to the right place. Like if you come here and then realize you're in the wrong place and then run over to the right room and arrive 20 minutes late, then you now have 20 minutes less to work. So that's the kind of jerk that I am. So please check this, figure out what room you need to go to. If you don't know how to get to that building, there's links on the webpage of how to find it on the campus map. So figure out where you need to be. If you have questions about that, please email me and Amy, the TA, uh, after class today, and we'll help you figure that out, OK? And anyway, I know your, your, your minds and your stress are probably focused on that right now. Um, but nevertheless, I'm going to teach you new material anyway. Uh, I can perhaps relieve a bit of stress by telling you that this material today is not covered on the exam, but then that also means you probably won't want to listen to me, so I don't know how to, how to thread the needle here. Uh, it's helpful for the assignments that are coming forward and stuff. So uh, anyway, what I want to do with our time today is I want to talk more about classes and objects. I want to kind of wrap up that discussion. And I also want to talk about some, I want to come back to linked lists. We did linked lists like last week, and I want to connect the class stuff to the linked list stuff and kind of put those together. So that's the plan. Um, so let me go to my slides here for a second. Uh, we talked about classes and objects. We kind of went over the basics. You have an H file with all your prototypes in it, and you have a CPP file with all the implementation of the bodies of the member functions. And you know, we kind of reviewed some of the concepts. I tried to focus mostly on the differences, the different syntax and stuff. So today I want to jump into some more syntax that's new. Like one of the last things that we saw kind of right at the end of class was that you can have this word const in a class. So you know, const means it won't change. It's a constant. You can't modify it. And um, in particular, I really wanted to emphasize this last usage of the word const, where you put it on a heading of a method. And just once again, what that does is it's a promise that this method will not modify the state of the object. So anybody who's using your class, they know that if they call that method, it's not going like, to wipe out the account or delete all the money or something like that. It also allows the compiler to check some stuff. Like if the person using my class declares a bank account object and they say that it's const, it will allow them to call get balance on that object, but it won't allow them to call deposit on that object because deposit is not declared as a const method. So uh, in assignments and stuff where you guys are going to write classes of objects, I'm going to ask you to please make method const where you can as much as possible. So I mean, basically what you're going to do is you're going to open up your H file and you're going to look through all the methods in there. And you're going to just ask yourself, like, do these methods modify the object or not? And if they don't, you should put const on them. So like here, I mean, I already kind of did this at the end of last class, right, as we were finishing up. But like depositing money changes the account. It's not constant. Asking for the balance is constant. Asking for the name on the account is constant. Withdrawing money is not, and so forth. So anytime I ask you to write a class, I want you to think about this, this aspect, OK? So that's const. Did you guys have any questions about that? I didn't really have time to take questions on it on uh, Monday. So any const questions? Yeah. So if your method is declared const, then for each of the parameters, it doesn't matter whether you call it const or not. Oh, you mean like if the method parameter, if this accepted any parameters? Yeah. Uh, the parameters could also be const or not, which is independent. So like I could pass in a vector reference here, and then this code could change that vector. What I'm promising is that it won't change the bank account, not anything particular promise about the parameters. If I want to promise that about the parameters, I declare the parameters as const. Yeah. It's a little confusing, because most of the time when you want to make something const, you put the word const at the start. And here you put it at the end. And the reason that you put it at the end is because if you put it at the start, it would be like what you're returning is a constant string. 
But what it's really saying is this is a method called string get name, and I am going to be const. And so they decided to indicate that by putting that at the end. And so, whatever. Um, yeah. So in a const method, I'm assuming can only call other const methods within the class. Yeah. Um, con they, there's this phrase they call const correctness which means like you've gone through your code, you've gone through your class, and you've really carefully thought about this issue, and you've applied the word const in all the proper places. And I'll tell you that kind of the worst state for a program to be in is where you kind of have partially applied const into your code, because then what you'll discover is like some stuff is const and some stuff isn't, and you'll get these compiler errors because something that isn't const is calling into something that is, or vice versa, and it's like, hey, you can't do that because you're not const or whatever. And, and so um, if you get errors about const stuff, it's probably because you either have not enough const or too much const or whatever. I've heard students tell me that what they do is they just try making everything const and then they erase, erase the ones that have errors on them. <laughs> and hey, fine, if that's what it takes, fine, do it. I mean, cool, but whatever. Um, okay, I wanna keep moving. I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff about classes and stuff, but I wanna, I wanna keep moving so I hit more, more topics here. So that's const. Uh, I wanna talk about operator overloading. So this is a very unique feature of C++ that I think is kind of interesting. In C++, you can actually add new meaning for operators in the language. And specifically, what you can do is you can define how an operator interacts with your type, with your class that you're writing. So if you have a, um, you know, a class that represents a matrix or something, you could define a times operator to do matrix multiplication. Whereas in a language like Java, you can't do that. You'd have to write a method called like dot times or dot matrix multiply. So this is kind of cool. This is a list of all the operators that you're allowed to override, overload. And I'm, some of these like, whoa, what? You can overload what the parentheses mean? The C++ lets you do some wicked shit. Uh, I don't want to talk about some of these operators. This is weird stuff, but like sometimes you want to do these operators. Most commonly, I override things like equals. You know, in Java, if you want to write a class that you can compare, you make an equals method. In C++, you don't make an equals method. You override an equals operator so that the equals operator just works. You know how strings, you can do equals equals on strings? That's because there's an overloaded equals operator for strings. You know, you can do that for your class, too. So that's the kind of stuff that I like. Um, our collection classes have operator overloading on them. If you have a vector and you want to add an element or a set, you can say plus equals. And that's actually a plus operator that we overloaded. Um, in the map and hash map, if you want to add or access a, a pair, you can use the square brackets for that. That's because we overloaded the square brackets operator in our class. So this is a pretty cool feature. Um, I, just as a slight editorialization, I would tell you that I think this feature is very easy to abuse. And if you add a bunch of operators to your class that are not very intuitive, then it can make it really easy to write weird looking code that's hard to read. Like the person using your code is doing times and divide and plus, and you decide to overload plus operator to do a deposit on a bank account. And the divided by operator extracts a, a, a transaction fee from a bank account. And it's like, what? You know, that's kind of unintuitive. I think you should only use these operators to do things that are sort of obvious, like equals equals should tell you whether things are equal to each other, stuff like that. Uh, in the back, yeah. Um, how is uh, the plus and minus sign equal How are plus and minus a unary operator? Yeah. Well, you could negate. You could say negative one. Oh, or you can say a minus b. So actually, these operators can be used as a single in front of a single uh, uh, value or in between two values. Yeah. Anyway, those are all operators that you can overload. If you want to do this, if you actually want to do this, then what you do is you basically write it as a function, OK? You basically think of it as if it were a function, but the function's name is like operator plus or operator equals equals or whatever. That's the name of the function. And then uh, the only thing that's a little bit confusing is like if it's a binary operation, like where you go A equals equals B, you basically think of it as a function called equals equals that takes two parameters, A comma B. So like the parameters would be two things, even though in your code one of the two things would be on the left side and the other thing would be on the right side, okay? So that's the syntax. Um, you just like with uh, the other class stuff that we've been doing, you declare it in the H and then you write the body of it in the, in the CPP. So like, let me just show you a quick example. Uh, we have this bank account class where you can deposit and withdraw and stuff like that. So like, if you just wanted to check whether two bank accounts were equal to each other, whether they had the same 
state, you could write an operator equals equals, and you could take a bank account BA1 and a bank account BA2. Um, there's some stuff missing. Uh, an operator, it's like a function, so it has to have a return type. What's a return type of equals equals? Cool, right? It either does or doesn't, true or false. The other thing is if you're passing these bank accounts, remember that every time you pass an object as a parameter, it makes a copy. So you should probably do this by reference. And equals equals doesn't modify the accounts. So you should probably say that it takes them as const bank account references. Now again, we just talked about const. And so you might be a little confused. You might have thought that this went here, const like that. But const goes at the end if it's a member function inside of a class. This actually isn't inside of a class. It's just a free floating operator that happens to work on operands that are bank accounts. So you don't say const at the end. If you want to promise that this operator doesn't modify the accounts, now you put const over here instead of over there. So I don't know, it's confusing stuff, right? So that's the heading for operator equals. And then if you want to implement it, right now I'm in bank account.h. If you want to write the actual body of it, you go to bank account.cpp here. Just go to the bottom or whatever and you say paste operator equals. Now again, in all these other methods, you might remember that I wrote bank account colon colon. That's because those are like members of each bank account object. This operator isn't. It floats out in the global space. It happens to have operands that are bank accounts. So I don't say bank account colon colon on this one. So if I want to see whether they're equal to each other, well, I mean, you basically just compare the state of the objects. So like, you know, they have an ID and a name and a balance. In fact, I don't think we really do anything with the ID in all of our code. So maybe I'll just delete. <laughs> we don't need IDs here at this bank. Your name is good enough. What's your name? <laughs> Carl? OK, here you got 20 bucks. Yeah, fine. Uh, it's, this is, must be Wells Fargo. We just make free accounts for people <laughs> without asking them, and then we take all their money. Um, yeah, so the name and a balance. If those were the same, then the accounts would be equal, maybe. So you'd say, well, you know, return uh, BA1 dot get balance equals BA2 dot get balance. And I guess you'd first compare the names. You'd say BA1 dot get name equals BA2 dot get name. And the balance equals. So you return true if that's true and return false if that's false, right? Um, one thing that's kind of interesting is that the, uh, this operator is calling these methods like dot get balance, whereas the code up here is referring directly to these like private uh, variables. These operators are technically not part of the class. And so actually, if I tried to just say like BA2 dot balance, it actually doesn't like that. Uh, you have a little error here. It says the balance is private in this context. So like technically the operator is an outside entity. Um, if you want to write an operator that is able to reach into the private things, of course you could hack and make them private variables public, but that's not cool. We're not supposed to do that, right? So um, if you want to <laughs> make it so that these operators can see the private variables, now in this example, that doesn't really give us very much benefit because you could just quickly ask for the value of the private variables by calling these get methods, but occasionally you might not have a getter method for every single, for whatever reason, you might need to like reach in there into that object. So you're going to love this. C++ has a way that you can get around this particular problem. And the way that you do that is you have the class up. So see, keep in mind, we have, our, we have our bank account class up here. And then down here, we have this operator that's outside of the class. The bank account class can specify selectively various other pieces of code that are allowed to reach into the private data of itself. Java, you can't do that. Like, that's not a thing Java does. It just has sort of public and private. C++ has this special thing you do. You can come up here and, like, in the class somewhere, you put the method, the, the, the operator here, and you put the word friend in front of it. <laughs> I'm not making this shit up. Look, it turns color. It's a real keyword, you know? I'm not making this up. It's, a, it's my friend. I love, if you think about it for a second, it's like, yeah, he's my friend, so he can touch my privates. It, to me, it. To me, it sounds more like friends with benefits. <laughs> but anyway, if you do that, then whatever function or whatever operator that you put there is allowed to look at the private data of the class. And that will get us so that if we wanted to over here, we could just say ba1.name equals ba2.name. 
and ba one dot balance balance equals uh, ba two dot balance. So now, okay, but I guess maybe I'm not being very clear. Like, is this better? Like, is this good style, or is this considered a hack or something? Uh, I would say this is generally considered okay because sometimes you sort of need these operators to be able to reach in and do this. And usually the operators are defined in the same file anyway, so it's not like you're just handing out friendship tokens to the whole world to puncture your object or whatever. I have a question. So why do you define the operator within the class, the header, and the file? Sorry, why do I define it here or here? Uh, yeah, like we have it outside, like down below. Right, the right. Um, Basically, here's where you're actually declaring it as like to the world, you're telling the world that this exists. And up here is like you're saying, hey, that guy is my friend. But like, I'm pretty sure if you only put it here, it doesn't work. It's kind of like the real one is this one. This one is like referring to that one or something like that. Also, you can, you can put this down in the, in the private part if you want. So it's like we're friends, but it's kind of on the DL. You know, I don't want people to know that they're my friend or something, whatever. But, this is kind of the, the syntax. This is how you do it. You can't just write all operator within the private, and then you have to say friend. Oh, you mean you mean just not putting it here? I think you need both. I forget. I mean, delete it and see if it's still. But we're not using it. The thing is, you have to call it, right? So, if I just comment that one out, I guess the question would be like, if I went to Wells Fargo and I said like, hey, if ba one equals ba two, see out. Wow. And uh, if BA1 equals BA1, those are equal. See out. Yup. It's very descriptive messages. Uh, so I guess that actually worked. Um, it printed yup because I'm equal to me, but I'm not equal to Maron. I think I knew that already, but whatever. Um, so I guess it did work. I've always seen it placed in both spots, but whatever, maybe it doesn't need to be in both. I think without the one saying friend, you can't put it here and say friend. Right. The one that says friend has to be inside of the class. Well, I mean, like, not even having a friend there, because you just kind of declare it as like an operator that belongs to this class, right? Like, well, right, but if you just say it like that, I think it doesn't work because it, um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't like that, basically. You're basically saying, that guy outside of me is my friend, so they can touch me however they want. <laughs> so whatever, right? Um, it's one of those kind of lectures. Uh, anyway, so that's operator overload, yeah? Is it bad coding style to write arbitrary the functions that are not the operators and make them friends? I think, in general, you want to minimize the use of friend. In general, if you have code that needs to see the private data of a class, then that code should probably be part of the class. Why else would it need that data? <coughs> or make a method that they can access the private data and look at it without modifying it or something. It just feels like the normal mechanism you guys have already learned for writing classes should mostly work. This is a very specific case where operators have to be written as these global functions that take operands on both sides. Therefore, to kind of, it's, this feature, frankly, is almost totally built for this kind of situation where, like, there's something that has to be outside of my class, but it inherently is very tightly coupled to what my class does. Therefore, I'll give you a, a key to the back door to come into the class and look at the private data. Yeah? Um, I have two questions. Uh, first, is there a syntax that uh, we define the operator as a class function, which, like, first input would be the, the same object, and the second one would be the object? Yeah, yeah. Um, so there is, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but there is another syntax for overloading operators where you can like omit the first operand and then like you are, like this is the first operand. So you can kind of do that, but I much prefer this syntax here because there's a lot of operators that cannot be written with that second syntax. And there's only some that can. There's kind of some weird rules about it, and this is by far the more common or encouraged like, syntax for it, I think. Also, this syntax allows things like int plus bank account and bank account plus int and sort of asymmetrical things where if it's inside the class, you have to be on the left side of the operator or something. So it's, anyway, there's other ways to do this, but um, this is the way that I, I think is the most encouraged. But what was the other question? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think overloading like in a function would be like you have a function foo that takes an int and the same function foo that takes a double or takes different type of parameters. So it's almost like we already have the equals operator that takes ints and doubles and strings, but now we're going to overload it so it also can take a parameter that's a bank account. So I think that's kind of where this gets its name. One thing I want to point out, I see your hands, I'll call you in a second. Um, these overloading of operators, it's really dumb and it does exactly what you say. For example, I wrote an equals equals operator here. So you might think that now that C++ knows how to test whether they are equal, that it must also know how to test whether they are not equal, right? Because those are obviously opposites of each other. So if I go here and say not equals, if you try to compile that, it'll say, you did not define a not equals operator. And it's like, are you kidding me? I told you equals, you can't figure out not equals. You actually have to go back to the class and you actually have to write a separate operator, not equals, and you have to friend him too. And when you go to the, that's the H file, now in the CPP file, you actually have to write a operator not equals. And actually what a lot of people do, you could rewrite this logic with nots in it, but a lot of people do like not BA1 equals BA2. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's really silly that those aren't automatically inferred from each other. That's just how they built the feature. There, you can, there are these obscure examples where equality and inequality are not exact opposites of each other. But because of that rarity, they decided to keep all these things really separate. Like less than does not give you greater than, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Can you sort of make your own operators by putting your own symbols after rule operator? Right, like operator, who, yeah, <laughs> whatever. Uh, no, um, I wish. <laughs> There's a list that is allowed. <laughs> I know, I know, but like, like your cat jumps on the keyboard and types a bunch of stuff. Like, uh, these are the exact set, and that's it. If you if it's not in this set, it's not part of the language spec. It doesn't work. Uh, in the back, yeah. So if you overload it in a global namespace, that means that anyone else interacting with it will be taking on the new definition or the old definition by default. Yeah. Once you add that operator to the project, now anytime somebody writes equals with those operands on the side of it, it'll call this. I see. So, so I guess the best way to approach it would be to avoid the overloading, because you might use some other object, a completely different object that calls equals equals, so you don't want to confuse uh, it. Well, this does not replace equals for ints or equals for doubles or something. This oh, is just okay. like, if you have equals and it happens to have exactly a bank account on each okay. side, do this. It does not replace any other context of equals, like on other types of stuff. Uh, yeah, question. Two questions. One, can you replace other context of equals? <laughs> like right? operator equals on ints or something? Yeah. Uh, I don't think you can. It's been a while since I tried this. A int b return a equals 42. <laughs> That'll throw them. Yeah, it says uh, you must have an argument that's a class or an enum type. So I think you can only define this on your own type. So I'm pretty sure you can't do it. There are some programming languages where you can do that. Like there's a language called Ruby where you can do kind of anything you want. And so you can set like the int three to have the value five and now three is five. <laughs> <laughs> you can change plus to do subtraction. So you could do all kinds of stupid things like that, but not here. Uh, was there another question? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, in this case, where for the not equals, you're just flipping the equals, does it matter what order they appear in the file? Um, no, as long as they both have a prototype with a semicolon, then each one will know about the other from the prototype. Yeah. It's okay. um, I want to keep moving in a second because this, you know, I have other stuff I want to cover, but maybe one question. Yeah. Uh, bye. Uh, can you use uh, this instead of using two parameters instead? Yeah, that was kind of her question. There is a syntax where you, like this, uh, are the first uh, operand. I don't want to show it very much. It's in the slides. I'm not going to talk about it much because only some operators support that syntax, not others. And the rules for which ones are kind of weird. This syntax is more universal. This is, I think, the more general encouraged uh, syntax. I want to keep moving. If you have other operator overloading questions, maybe we can take them later. I just I got a lot of other stuff I want to cover, but this is kind of the basics of operator overloading. I want to show you a particular operator that's pretty important and pretty common to overload, which is the less than less than operator. And this is the operator that's used when you do C out, like when you print stuff. So actually, you know, in Java, if you want to make an object printable, what do you do? 
you write a two-string method, right? Java, that's like a special citizen in Java. That method is special. It'll make it so you can print that object on the console. In C++, you could write a method named toString, but that method is in no way special. It's not called automatically by C++, so that method doesn't do what you would want. If you want to make something printable, you override what the less than, less than operator does when it is past an output stream. C out is an object of type output stream. And your thing, reference usually so it doesn't copy it. And the weird thing about it though is that this method, this operator, it returns the output stream as its return value. That's a little weird, but the reason that it does that is when you actually do C out, arrow something, arrow something, arrow something, like each of those sub expressions returns C out so that the next expression can evaluate with C out. It's just weird, don't think about it too much. But <laughs> if you want to make your object printable, you write this. So just let me really quickly show you that um, because I want you to be able to write that operator on a class on an assignment or something. So you say O stream reference operator less than less than and you take an O stream reference for whatever output you want to send it to and then you take a, I don't know, consk bank account BA. And actually I need to declare it in the, um, the H file first. I just jumped to the H file. Uh, I could make it a friend. It depends. I, I mean... So up here, I have to I have to include IO stream because I'm using the IO streams now in the bank account class. So so yeah, so I, I declare this heading down here, and now back here, I say basically just you just pretend that out is C out. So you just go like out arrow dollar sign B A dot get balance, you know something like that. Um, maybe you'd say out uh, B A dot get name comma, like, like something like that. Um, wait, what did I do wrong? Uh, out arrow, oh, they're missing a, like that. One thing is you don't usually put endl because like you want to let whoever's calling this decide if there should be an endl at the end of this or not. You should just only print yourself with nothing else around you. Now, how did I decide what format to print? I just made that up, like the name and a comma and the money. Um, now that I have that operator, if I go over to the Wells Fargo and I say, hey, you know, see out, BA1 is arrow, BA1, arrow, endl. And then I do the same thing for BA2. So now when it gets to like here, it's gonna call my less than less than operator and it's gonna like run that printing code that prints me. So it prints um, BA1 is Marty zero dollars, BA2 is Mehran lots of dollars, right? So uh, fairly, simple, but uh, I wanted to show you that because, I mean, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about that particular operator, but like, that's how you make something printable. Yeah? Uh, you define function zero reference, like, O-string and operator, but why, when you define function zero reference, why is this a reference? No, the, the function. Oh, over here? Yeah. Um, it returns the output stream, but it doesn't want to return a copy of the output stream, so, I don't know, I mean, this is the heading that this operator has to have, basically. Because when you say C out arrow something, it prints the thing and then that expression evaluates to be C out. So that then if you also have another arrow something, it'll take C out arrow the next thing. And it, it actually does that by those returns of C out, basically. Yeah. But like, let's say if it's a function, what does it turn into a bank account? Then would it be better to return a reference to it? I don't know, make it dollar. Yeah, I mean, I think the returning of a reference is kind of, can kind of twist your head around a little bit. Um, I would say in general, returning references, you should be really hesitant to do that because if you're returning a reference to a local variable, the local variable is about to get smushed out by the stack. And now you've literally returned a reference to a thing that just died and that would break the program. Um, so mostly you don't want to return references to things, but occasionally you do and you only want to do it if you know that the thing you're returning is not going to go away. And I know this isn't going to go away because he's a reference for me and I'll return him back as a reference for you and so he lives in whoever function declared him and so he's not going to go away when I'm done and I didn't declare him so I'm not going to clean him up. And So returning references to things is something to be done rarely with caution. It just happens to be what you must do in this uh, circumstance and I don't know, I mean, for what we need to do, like you'll just always print the thing and then return the output stream that was passed to you. There's no more logic to it than, than that. Yeah. For instance, when we're defining 
Right. So actually, if I were to go into more detail on operators, like some of the operators, you return a reference to yourself because plus equals modifies you and then returns you. So you return this basically, like a reference to yourself. Yeah, star this actually. But yeah, you, yes, there are some operators where you return references for that reason. I'm not going to overload them today, but that would be the right way to think of it. Yeah. Or do we need to do this on the exam? Uh, I will not ask you to overload an operator on the midterm. No, I won't ask you to do that. Or if I ever did on like a final, I would make sure to give you the, the headings that you need. Okay? So anyway, uh, I want to move on. Um, one more thing I want to talk about. Let's see. I want to talk about destructors for a second. You guys have seen constructors when an object is born. It calls the constructor. You can add parameters to initialize the object. C++ also has something called a destructor. Sometimes students call it a deconstructor, but it's a destructor. It's not a deconstructor. Um, whatever. The syntax of it is you put a tilde, and then it looks like a constructor otherwise. Uh, tilde means negation in binary arithmetic, so it's meant to be like this is a not constructor kind of. Um, it is called when the object is being thrown out, being cleaned up, being deleted out of the memory. The object is dying. And what you would do in there, in general, you don't necessarily have to write one of these things, but what you would do is if your object allocated any pointers or any new objects on the heap, you would want to free them up and delete them in there to make sure that your class doesn't leak any memory. So actually, I can't show you a good demo of that here with the bank account because the bank account class just has an int and a string or a double and a string. You don't need to like clean those up the only case where you would need to clean those up would be if you had like a foo star f and you had made a new foo and then when your object was dying you'd have to delete f basically. You'd have to, if you had some kind of pointer thing that you had allocated in here, you would want to clean it up. Um, and I'll show you an example in a minute of when you would do that, but that's kind of the general idea. So if you want to see the destructor in action, you can write here bank account. That's the destructor. And then in here in the CPP file, I could say uh, bank account colon colon destructor just to help see it work. I could do like see out destructor called endl. Okay. Um, in fact, I could even say like for, and then I could do this, which is me. You know, I print myself. Uh, I put star this because this is a pointer to me, and star this means go to that what I'm pointing at. But whatever. So print myself, okay, when I'm dying, print, print my name or something. Um, so then over here in the, in the Wells Fargo client, I think what you would see is kind of right at the end of the program, you would see uh, the destructor got called on Neron and then it got called on Marty. Um, and so it's at the end, it's when the program is shutting down. The reason it's at the end is because these objects fall out of scope at the end of, of main. You know, they live from the start of main to the end, so that's when it destructs them. If you had a, uh, an object that lived for a shorter span, you know, void foo, and then in here you, you know, you created uh, another bank account, BA3, and it was like, uh, you know, Keith Schwartz or something, uh, whatever, and he has, you know, 50 bucks, whatever he has. Like, you know, here I could say um, foo, and so what's going to happen is it's going to call the function. It's going to create Keith. The function returns. It's going to clean up the Keith object. It's going to call his destructor. And so I'll see that message about Keith earlier in the output. You see that? So he gets destructed right after those first couple of, uh, of print messages. Yeah, back. If we define the object in the heap instead of the stack, would the destructor be called in the heap the delete keyword? Right. So actually, if you have bank account star BA3 equals uh, new bank account, Keith Schwartz. That's, he, Keith is now living out on the heap now. Um, and if you run this and you look carefully at the um, code, you won't ever see a line that says destructor called for Keith because I never, it doesn't get, that's exactly what it means to allocate something on the heap is that it will not be destructed by the program until you delete it. If you call delete, it will invoke the destructor. So yes, that's a good distinction. And in fact, this currently, this program leaks the memory for Keith. I lose track of him because I lose my pointer to him. So, oops. Uh, question, yeah. Uh, 
does it like clean up that um, once the entire executable closes? Or is there now RAM used on your laptop uh, that is for that object that is now just like stuck there? Yeah, right. it's, it's the former. Um, if, if I don't free memory, like if I leak this memory for Keith, that memory is occupied by my program and sort of unretrievable until my program exits. At the moment my program exits, the operating system wipes out all the memory I used, even if it was leaked. So luckily it goes back and I don't have to like reboot or inst buy a new computer or whatever, right? Um, <laughs> That's the good news, but yeah, but if, and again, it doesn't matter very much for this program, but if I run a long-lived program like a server, that stuff matters a lot. Yeah. So if you somehow knew the pointer to the new guy, you still wouldn't be able to execute it. It would just be white hard. If I knew the point, like you mean later in my main or something? Yeah, somehow you if you, could, if you somehow had that pointer, that memory address, I could go there and Keith's object would still be there. If it's leaked, it's still there. It's just I, I don't have a way of reaching it to clean it up. Even, or use even it. right now, when the program terminates, the OS probably wipes it all out, or, or, or like I guess it, it often just leaves the state of memory as it found it. But so, so technically, poor Keith is floating around. Help me! Help! I'm floating in the memory. No one freed me. Something like that. But um, but I mean, basically, it's it's lost to the to the world. Uh, yeah. Question. Is there a that at the end of the menu, right, that every memory in Keith which is used now freedom or something? Free, like, free everyone, like somehow when we get down here, like free them all, or, or just manually we could say that. No, I mean, C++ doesn't keep any kind of log of where all these things are. Like, we don't have a way of asking it to free all those up. Um, Java and other languages keep track of that stuff for us, and they call it automatic garbage collection, but um, we don't have that here. It basically, for speed purposes, they don't want to keep all those listed of things, because that would take up memory and time to track all that. So they just figure you keep track of it, or else it's your problem, kind of, you know? It's the kind of language that we're working with. So, okay, the bank account class is pretty short and pretty simple, just kind of wanted to practice the syntax. I think a more interesting example is um, if you make the link list into a class. I'm not gonna code this with you guys, but all those methods that we wrote, like add, remove, that took a front of a link list, what you could do is take all that code, paste it into a class, okay? But then the one change that you would make is how all those methods took a front, 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 front pointer. You would remove that parameter from all of the headings of those functions. And instead of it being a parameter, it would be a private variable of the linked list. So they have access like this dot front instead of you having to pass front as a parameter. And so now all the methods just take the parameters the user would want to pass, like the value or the index or whatever it is that they want to manipulate. So I, I don't know if I have that code in my slide here, but it kind of looks like this. You know, you, you can make a linked list, you can add stuff, you can get stuff, you can set stuff, you can remove stuff. And this, this code is algorithmically the code we wrote last week. It's just you sort of restructure it a little bit. Again, I don't think I have the bodies of the methods in the slides, but that's because they're the bodies that we already wrote. And this is a place where you would want a destructor, because inside here you have this like chain of nodes and if you never end up clearing them out, then when the linked list is being thrown away, you should loop over the chain of nodes and free them all up. And then this is an example of where you would, the destructor would help you to do that. Yeah? When you implement something like a linked list for the class, would it be typical to have a private variable for size that you use instead of having a size method that we would have to do if we didn't have a class? You could certainly keep an int for the size. Um, sometimes you're supposed to do that or not supposed to do that, depending on like if your instructor says you can or can't, or if you have some memory constraint or some other reason of doing it. But yeah, you could keep an int for the size. You could increase it on the add and decrease it on the remove. And then if you were asked for the size, you don't actually have to walk across and count. So that's a nice benefit. Yeah, question? So we were gonna implement a linked list in our project where would we define the list node struct? Would we, we wouldn't do that inside the same class, or like what would yeah, um, that in? Yeah, the little struct is usually just in its own little file called listnode.h. It could be in the same file as this, but it's more common for each data type to have its own file that you create. And when I give you a starter project, if I want you to have a certain node, I'll just make a little h file for you with the node in it. I'll post the code for this if you want to look at this. I'm not trying to keep this a secret from you, but basically all I'm going to do is copy and paste all the code we wrote last week into here. So um, I want to spend the last minutes that we have briefly talking about a couple of advanced versions of linked lists. And I'm intentionally going to only talk about them briefly because then I want you to go 
look at them more as part of what your homework assignment is going to be. And I know that's exactly what you want to think about right now is homework. Um, but hey, you can, do, you can worry about that after the test. But I want to talk about two variations of linked lists called doubly linked lists and skip lists. And you might say, Jesus, why are you introducing this in the last 10 minutes of the last lecture on this? And again, I'm intentionally being brief because I want you to uh, explore this. But here's a really fast introduction to something called a doubly linked list. The idea is every node has not only a next pointer, but it also has a previous pointer. Otherwise, it's very much the same idea as you've seen already with a linked list. Uh, one other variation is that you often will keep a back pointer in addition to keeping a front pointer. The main benefit of doing this is that you can now walk both directions in the list. If you want to go to the end and loop to the beginning, easy to do that. The downsides are the nodes take up a little bit more memory because they each have another pointer in them. And when you're doing the code, you have to move more arrows and manipulate. You have to make sure to keep both directions chains correct all the time. So that can make the coding slightly tougher, right? So it depends. Like if you need to be able to walk both ways, you maybe should do this. If you don't need to walk both ways, then maybe you don't need the back pointers. All those other methods we wrote before, we didn't need any back pointers. So, um, OK, so if you're doing a double linked list, if you're thinking about adding things, basically when the list is empty, both the front and the back pointers are null. If you add a single element, both the front and the back are that node. It has no pre even it has no next, because he's the only element. If you add another element, it kind of depends if you're adding them at the front or the end or the middle. If you're adding them at the end, you've got to set back. And his preem is the front, and the next, the next to the front is him. You've got to, like, I'm, I'm reading all the things you have to change here, basically. If you add to the front, you're going to change the front pointer, and you've got to point him to the old front, and the old front has to go back point to him. And so there's a little more arrow manipulation. You basically have to do two directions worth of pointers here to get this to work. But again, all the same stuff you guys have been practicing, like, I have this picture and I want that picture. Like all that stuff is still applicable here, basically, right? Removing from a doubly linked list, you uh, remember if you remove from a C, like if you want to remove this guy, you get James Bond standing right here and you point the next across over him, right? But you also need to talk to this guy and point his preview over him. So it's like two arrows have to be changed, right? So. It's not the hardest thing in the world, but you've got to watch out. Because if you only do it one way, if you only move this pointer, but you don't move that pointer, then like, if you go the different directions, you'll get a different <laughs> list. Like, if you go backwards, you'll still see this guy. But if you go forwards, you won't. And you get these weird inconsistencies in the state, basically. So that's like removing from a double linked list. And actually, when you remove from the ends, you have to be careful about the back pointer or the front pointer or both. Particularly tricky state is if you have just one element, you have to null up both the front and the back at the same time. So you've got to be a little careful about all that stuff. Got to draw some pictures, right? That's a doubly linked list. You're going to do this on a program called Tiles, where you're going to have a linked list of these rectangles. And when you click them, you move them to the front or you move them to the back or whatever. And so being able to go both directions is good. Um, you loop around in the list looking for stuff and grab it and move it to the front, move it to the back, that sort of thing. You'll see. The next one, this one's lots of fun. You're going to love me for this one. You ready? The next one's called a skip list. I'll go back to the sli other slides in a second. And you're like, oh god, <laughs> why didn't I take 106B? That's what you're saying right now. I know you're thinking that. I can see it on your faces. A skip list is a sorted link list. But in addition to just having next pointers, it also has these sort of express lanes that jump you multiple nodes at a time. And the advantage of this structure is if you are at the start and you want to get to a certain value, you're looking for the value 8 or something, you don't have to walk one by one by one to get there. You can skip way ahead and get there faster. If you do this right, you can get sort of a logarithmic O of log n kind of long run time to find things or add things or remove things from this structure. It only really works if the contents are sorted, because if they're in a random order, then the express lane doesn't have no idea whether you want to take the express lane or not. That's the general idea here. Sorted list, express lanes. How does this actually work? How do you get these? What is this picture really supposed to be? These are nodes, and the gray little parts are data boxes, like we had before, like an int for data. All these blue guys are next pointers. Well, how do you have some nodes with four next pointers and some nodes with two next pointers? Typically, what you do is you keep a vector of pointers. <laughs> and so you have usually at least one element of that vector, if not two, three, four elements of that vector. 
So that's kind of the idea. Does the idea make sense? I mean, I want to tell you how to do it, have some of the details of it in a second, but is this like general concept clear? Why is there no uh, uh, four or six? Four, oh, why, why in here? Oh. It just happens to be those numbers. I, I, I added one, two, three, five, seven, eight, nine. Uh, I guess the, you know, I could have added a four, but this just happens to be the set of data that I put in here. Maybe a different question would be like, why is this one this tall and why is this one this tall? Like, how do you decide who's how tall? I want to address that in a second. There's different ways you could decide that, but let, let's go through some stuff. So one thing is, typically what you do with a skip list is your front, is actually a node that has meaningless data and it has lots of pointers, so it helps you walk across all the little chains that you've got here. This is the structure that you have. You store a value of some kind followed by a vector of pointers to the nexts or something. <laughs> and um, we call this thing like a dummy header. Basically what this means is that your friends will never be null. You always just kind of set up a node here, but his only purpose is to get you started looking for the other nodes. So in other words, front.data is meaningless, but front.next data or front next number two data, that might be relevant, okay? This is implementation detail, makes it easier to code. So now, <clears throat> how do you look for something in a skip list? It's not that hard if you actually understand the structure. Remember that it's sorted. So what you do is, if you know that you have what, like this is four levels, vector elements zero through three, you start up at three, you have some int i set to three or something, you look at the pointer stored at three, and you peek ahead and you see what's going to, what are you going to get to if you follow that pointer? Oh, I'm going to get to a node that has a value eight. Maybe I'm looking for seven, let's say. So I don't want to take this road, it's too far, right? Because if it's an eight and it's sorted, I've gone too far, and seven won't be after an eight. So no, I don't want to take that road, so I do minus minus on my level or whatever. So if, 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 if it's good to go right, you go right, but if it's bad to go right, like it is in my example here, then instead of going right, you go down. Level minus minus, now I'm on level two. Do I want to go to the right to get to find seven? Sure, because of what's over there is a three, so I haven't gone far enough yet, so I jump across. Now I'm here. You never go up, you always go right or down. So I'm here, now do I want to go right? If I go right again, I get to an eight, that's too far, I want to find seven, so nope, I go down. So now I look again, do I want to go right? Oh, look, a seven, I found it. So you're, you're kind of just going right down, right down, right down, and as much as you can. You go right if you can, and down if you can't, until you either find it, or what? What? Well, okay, if it's a seven, you would. What if I search for a six or a 10? You, 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 it's possible that you won't find it. How will you know that you didn't find it, or that it's not there? Yeah. Go ahead. Like I'm looking for a six, and I kind of I get to the point where I go here, and the next after me is a seven, and I can't go down anymore because I'm at the bottom floor. So I give up. I could just stop. I don't even have to walk the rest of the way. It's not going to be there. Yeah. If you get to the bottom level and you see something bigger than the thing you're searching for, you just stop. Right. That's the idea. That's how to search. Okay. So I drew a little squiggle here to find a seven, but. How do you add something to a skip list? If you're going to add a six, it would conceptually go kind of right there, right? Okay, fine. So you'd use that same sort of searching pattern to figure out where a six is supposed to go. Right down, right down, right down. Aha, six should be right here after this guy, after this five. So you add it. Fine. But it gets a, it's not quite that simple. Because that would be great, you know, if you were adding a six that had a, a height of one. But some of these nodes should have more levels to them. We didn't address that yet. How do you know how many levels the thing should have? There's a really cool way of answering that, which is you just flip a coin. <laughs> and you might say, what? That sounds like BS. No way. But basically what you do is you start out with just one next pointer like this guy. And you flip a 50-50 coin. If you get heads, you bump it up to two levels. And then you flip again. If you get heads in your coin again, you bump it up to three levels. You flip, flip, flip. Just mathematically, probabilistically, what that means is half the nodes will be eliminated roughly at each level, roughly half. So your levels will kind of have these little spikies like this, like on my picture. Not perfectly, but roughly. You can do some proofs that it basically comes out to be roughly that. So again, flip a coin, flip a coin, flip a coin. So when you're going to add a node, what you do is you flip, flip, flip to decide how many levels it should have. And once you decide that, like this example has one level, if it had two, you would have to attach it to two chains. If it had three, you'd have to attach it to three chains. If it had four, you'd have to attach it to four chains. Basically, however many chains it has, you've got to find the right spot for it, and you've got to hook all the chains into it so it'll become 
part of all the appropriate skip express lanes on your skip list. Uh, yeah, question. Let's say you flip another true after that. Do you just have to add another pointer at the front? What if you flip true, 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 and you flipped another true? <laughs> Raise the roof, yo. <laughs> you just got to make another, you got to go expand. It's a vector, so you can go back here and just expand it. We're building a new express lane just for me because I flipped taller than anybody had ever been before. So go for it, yeah. So you use the same searching logic. You walk sideways if you can, you go down if you can't. But if you ever get to a point where your guy has a level and you can't go sideways anymore because there's not, no reason to go sideways, then you need to attach your guy there. Basically, if I'm, oh wait, wait, wait what's the, um, if you're attaching this six, basically you start at the top level of six, which would be here, and you walk sideways until you see where a six should go in this chain after a three but before an eight. So what you do is you attach this pointer to the top of a six right there. Then you go down and you keep doing the same process. I also want to attach a six here because he comes before a seven. So I cut this arrow and I attach him to the second level of the six over there. I go down. I don't want to attach the six here because the five is less than him. So I go right. Ah, I do want him here before this seven. So basically you go left or right down, right down, right down, and you attach at each level where he's in the right sort of order. And once you're done doing that, You've reestablished the sorting and you've reattached all the different lines of express lane to your collection. Yeah? Wouldn't it be uh, faster to get, uh, to get, um, uh, to find a six in this if you actually had a more even a distribution of the towers where it goes like, one, two, one, four, one, two, one, eight. Um, sure, the, the, the certain, shapes, certain shapes of these heights are better for certain yeah. searches, absolutely. But since it's really hard to maintain a perfect shape in the space of adding and removing and rearranging, basically this flip coin stuff kind of shuffles up the heights enough that you get very asymptotically close to like what would be a really good distribution of the heights. This is just my example on slides. But you got to trust me that the coin flipping, like smarter people than me have done rigorous proofs that that coin flipping is a good strategy that pr provides a good runtime. I got to stop because I'm out of time. On your homework, you get to try this along with other fun things. Don't worry about that for now. You can go stress out about my test first. Good luck with your studying. I will see you guys tomorrow night. Thank you.